Thank you so much, David, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And the reason I did all those fellowships, I'm just old. It really is a sign of elderly uh, moments here. Um, I, uh, people always ask about HIV dermatology. Is it still as big a deal as it ever was? And uh, I like to tell the story about Dr. Kapashi, famous for Kapashi sarcoma, who was a very famous dermatologist who lived in Austria um, end of the 1800s or so. Very smart guy. Uh, he married the chairman of dermatology's daughter and as a wedding present was given his father-in-law's 13 psoriasis patients because that was going to be a lifelong dowry, if you will. Uh, <laughs> Now, does that mean that dermatologists are really just very bad at treating things? And, and that may be. But it also signifies to me that dermatology just keeps coming up. Uh, even with our antiretrovirals, we see a lot of interesting things in HIV dermatology, sometimes easier to treat, but new things, uh, old things that rear their head again. So with that, I really want to tell you about who we are seeing in the present day. So first of all, there's obviously the group who starts ARVs now at very high CD4 counts, as many of our guidelines are trying to push, uh, especially on the West Coast in San Francisco. We're treating anyone and everyone who is HIV infected, regardless of their CD4 count. Then we have this other group, what I want to call the well-controlled aging patient. And then we have the young patient who has a low CD4 counts. Most of these patients are non-adherent. Uh, they are our disenfranchised patients, or they're not yet linked to care. So that's really our, our three categories. Let me start with the HIV-infected patient who starts ARVs at a very high CD4 count. This is a picture of acne. Uh, and I always laugh because I really went into HIV dermatology so that I could avoid acne and acne treatment. But lo and behold, I am seeing a whole lot of this acne, and again, characterized by comedones and cysts and papules. You all know what this looks like. But we call this immune reconstitution acne. This is not happening at persons who have low CD4 counts. In fact, you've got to have a high CD4 count so you can mount this response uh, as an inflammatory response. What do we do? Standard treatment with doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day. It's a great anti-inflammatory when it's not in shortage around the country. Uh, use it, works well. For some of this very big, bad inflammation, you can add prednisone for about a three-week course, again, like you would with immune reconstitution, anything. And sometimes we go to isotretinoin or Accutane, very helpful, again, if the patient has a lot of this inflammatory reaction. And again, just a close-up of that inflammation. This guy, very high CD4 count, uh, like 600, started his antiretrovirals and got this inflammatory acne. And this, too, is a, a patient with immune reconstitution, acne rosacea. Here again, a thing that we're seeing. Uh, and with this gentleman, you can see he's got the erythema of acne rosacea, some papules and pustules, and that sort of red nose. This goes hand in hand with seborrheic dermatitis. So again, in persons who have high CD4 counts who start their antiretrovirals, you may in fact see this. Eosinophilic folliculitis. We used to see this with low CD4 counts. You could walk into a room and say, ha ha, that guy's CD4 count is under 200. That's what we told our residents. But now, of course, we see this also with immune reconstitution, uh, especially at any CD4 count. But again, even at high CD4 counts, we're seeing immune reconstitution eosinophilic folliculitis. So a little bit more difficult to predict what a person's CD4 count is. But I'm also seeing this when people have underlying 
fungal diseases or mycobacterial disease, and they're starting their antiretrovirals. They seem to get eosinophilic folliculitis, immune reconstitution from outer space. Uh, this guy here, not from outer space kind, but this is eosinophilic folliculitis, really characterized by these very urticarial, itchy bumps, primarily on the chest, but the key is they are on the scalp and look at the neck. If your patient has an itchy bump like this on the neck, that's likely eosinophilic folliculitis. Acne, acne rosacea does not itch and usually doesn't fit that distribution. And again, more widespread. This is a gentleman uh, who restarted his antiretrovirals. He has underlying histoplasmosis restarts his antiretrovirals because he's not the most adherent of patients. Uh, and everyone was worried, gee, is this some kind of histoplasmosis? This is just eosinophilic folliculitis, but wall to wall, just an exuberant immune reaction when restarting antiretrovirals with an underlying fungal disease or TB. And again, this is the gentleman's forehead, same guy, just very widespread, itchy bumps, uh, as you see there. Well, warts, another bane of my existence. Uh, I think our previous speaker talked about warts being you know, in the millions and really uh, endless warts, genital warts, big burden of disease, and certainly not dependent on CD4 count. Uh, I did want to say that the, now that we're seeing patients uh, earlier in terms of their CD4 counts, we're probably going to have a lot more patients entering care complaining of genital warts. So are we preventing anything by treating these existing warts? Don't know. Uh, we'd like, we, we don't have that information because we don't know really how to get rid of the HPV virus. So even if we're treating warts and we're burning them, electrocuting them, et cetera, et cetera, we aren't doing anything for the HPV virus. We are not getting rid of that HPV virus in any way. This is a picture of uh, perianal warts, but please note, I just want to show you this kind of velvety and unusual, whiter than you would expect. This is Bowen's disease or squamous cell carcinoma in situ. Uh, and again, if you were to biopsy, you would see dysplasia that's somewhat invasive. Uh, again, on the surface of the skin, but squamous cell carcinoma in situ or Bowen's disease. Well, as was mentioned, the quadrivalent vaccine is now recommended for males and females before they are sexually active. What does this do for warts? Well, there was an Australian study that demonstrated that the prevalence of warts in females 21 to 26 was greatly decreased in those persons who received the vaccine. In heterosexual men, it did, in fact, substantially decrease warts. I'm talking about genital warts, not dysplasia. There was some evidence here of herd immunity. But for women who were over the age of 30, there was not a significant decrease in their warts, and certainly not a significant decrease in males, MSMs, over the age of 30. Again, this is for warts. So we're waiting to see if the vaccine shows a decrease in warts in MSMs when, they are, when the vaccine is given earlier in the patient's sexual history. Joel Pileski, as was talked about earlier, is really the champion who is trying to do this study, uh, trying to recruit young MSMs and get the vaccine going in this group. We will follow along to see whether or not that does anything to the wart burden. And again, just more genital warts, as you see here on the scrotum this time. Now, how do we treat genital warts? Well, I'm not very good at it, so if anyone has great ideas, please see me after the, the talk. We can always use hints. Uh, these data that I'm about to present are not from HIV-infected cohorts. What about Amiquimod or Aldara? Easy to use, but not very effective, and certainly not as effective as cryotherapy. Still quite expensive. What about cryotherapy and pedophilin together? and we're talking about pedophilin 25%. This seems to be the most effective at clearing warts. Um, partial clearance noted after at least two sessions, but 
may take up to 12 sessions. And so you have to tell your patient to be a patient patient when treating warts because again, no miracles here. Uh, and really, what are we doing? We're not eradicating the wart virus. So the recurrence rate is very high. And again, you need to warn your patients about that. Well, what to do? Should we do anything at all? Uh, maybe look at these warts and think about the anal pap smears, looking for dysplasia. But again, is that completely linked? We really don't know. Certainly, I admit to my patients that I'm not great at clearing this disease or preventing recurrence of warts. And I emphasize that our treatment won't get rid of the HPV field effect. Absolutely not. There is only one study that uh, demonstrated that imiquimod might actually be helpful to prevent recurrent warts, but no data on how long to use it or what the long-term results are. So in other words, if I can get rid of warts with cryotherapy and pedophilin and then use the imiquimod in a preventive sense to prevent the recurrence of warts, that seems to have some efficacy but I have not done the study to demonstrate that, and as I say, there's only one study that even mentions this at all. Speaking of warts, and I hope you can all see this, it's not very easily seen live and in person on patients, but these are almost these very pink, flat patches that you see really around the chest area, the neck. And if you look closely, you might think, well, maybe that's tinea versicolor. You wouldn't be wrong in thinking that, but this is not tinea versicolor. This is also a wart type called epidermodysplasia verusiformis. And I show you these also, these more darkly colored. This is not epidermodysplasia verusiformis, but similar. These are flat warts. Epidermodysplasia verusiformis, specific wart types five and eight. And as I say, often mimics that tinea versicolor. It's usually a shade lighter than the patient's skin. It is important because it's exacerbated by immune reconstitution. So again, you're starting a patient up on these antiretrovirals. They get this. They think they're having a drug reaction. They have no idea why this has just bloomed. And they will stop their meds. They will come to you, what the heck is this? So know about this disease. This is not uncommon. And the congenital form of this disease, it is associated with squamous cell carcinoma. We have never seen squamous cell carcinoma develop out of this in the HIV-infected patient. So that's the good news. The treatment for this is a drug acetretin which is very much like Accutane, but was made for psoriasis. It also works for this at very low dose. Acetretin, 10 milligrams daily, should take care of it. And again, here's this gentleman with his epidermodysplasia verusiformis, characterized by these very pink patches. And again, widely uh, distributed in this particular patient. Please note this phenomenon in the scratch mark. He's got warts. That's a very common phenomenon we call the Kebner phenomenon. You see that in warts, you see that in psoriasis, but again, use that as an indicator to think about warts. And for any of you who do work abroad, I do a lot of work in Kenya and Uganda and also South Africa, and this is a very common situation you will see in young people in those countries. Again, epidermodysplasia verusiformis. This is extremely sick, stigmatizing. We tend to see this in young HIV-infected patients. We have no treatment. Acetretin we can't get and or use. We're thinking about vaccines given at a very early age, uh, attacking HPV 5 and 8. Uh, but uh, we're not there yet. But again, something to see, and everyone who has this is HIV infected in these countries, and again, extremely stigmatizing problem. I know that you spent some time talking about HCV, and uh, of course, with our new treatments of HCV, uh, particularly the new protease inhibitors uh, that have been developed against hep C, we're seeing some very interesting rashes. In the non-immunosuppressed host, about 55% of patients had a drug reaction, mostly of the eczematous type, so nothing terrible, and most of those you can treat through in your patient. 
Uh, you can put some topical steroids on, as we're apt to do in dermatology, and see them back. Make sure that they don't develop in anything worse. And here's a gentleman. He was quite irritated by this particular rash to one of the new protease inhibitors. But it really is very eczematous. He scratched it so much that he now has this nice erosion. But you slap some triamcinolone, 0.1% ointment on that, see him back. This really does go away. Not a big problem. You can treat through. You don't have to stop the medication. As opposed to this patient, also started a new hepatitis C treatment, uh, HIV infected, and he gets the more serious rash. Uh, and as you can see here, he's got these red, bluish areas that aren't particularly itchy. They're just very widespread. This is erythema multiforme. And about 6% of patients on these new protease inhibitors have the serious drug reaction. Uh, characterized by either drug hypersensitivity, these patients develop fever, eosinophilia, redness, or, as I just showed you, erythema multiforme. What do you do? In those cases, you must stop the drug because this can just get worse. And interestingly, just after you stop the drug, actually, this reaction gets a little bit worse. And Patients get sent back by their practitioners saying, hey, we stopped this new protease inhibitor, but the patient's getting worse. Are you sure it's not the ribavirin that's doing it? And the answer is, I'm sure it's not the ribavirin that's doing it. Uh, this takes a long time to clear the system. And the erythema multiforme actually gets a little bit worse before it gets better. Uh, why that is, I'm not exactly sure. But again, here's a picture of the erythema multiforme. Uh, and you can see characterized by this blue necrotic center, which is really the hallmark of erythema multiforme. So again, widespread, stop the drug. Do you need to give this patient prednisone? No, you do not. Just get rid of the drug. When do we use prednisone for a patient with a drug reaction? Only if they have eosinophils that are infiltrating lung, only if their creatinine is going up or their liver function tests are going up. Otherwise, just stop the drug. Be patient, and as I say, particularly with these drugs, because the reaction gets a little bit worse before it gets better. Well, now we have this whole category of the successfully treated aging HIV-infected patient. And the only really great thing about being as old as I am is I actually grew up with many of these patients. So when I was an intern, they were getting their first treatments, and this whole group is a group that I have known well because these are the most adherent of patients. They were the ones who used to set their watches and take their meds, and I've been seeing them throughout time. So they keep coming back, thankfully. And what, are, what is this group developing? Well, they are developing those problems that we get in the aging patient. Uh, with regard to skin. And one of the big ones are these actinic keratoses, really ravages of chronic sun exposure. And, and in California, many of our patients who are HIV uh, in fact, and diagnosed 20 to 25 years ago who thought they weren't going to make it bought nice little resort homes in very uh, hot places and had a lot of sun exposure. And we are now seeing that come to roost, so to speak. So actinic keratosis, about 3 to 10% of these turn into squamous cells. The treatment of this is cryotherapy or liquid nitrogen. And here are just some pictures uh, of actinic keratosis because patients will come in with them now. And you can see these are these red adherent areas that you can feel more than even see. And again, in this patient, you can feel that more than even see it. Rub your fingers against it. You can feel this scale that just never goes away, actinic keratoses. Don't forget to look at the top of the ears, all the sun-exposed areas, particularly in men. Again, this is just an actinic keratosis. Uh, it is not a squamous cell carcinoma yet. There's no uh, dermal component to it. Uh, again, liquid nitrogen would be effective here in getting rid of this. This, on the other hand, is an actinic keratosis that has made the transformation to squamous cell carcinoma. How do I know this? Because this patient had an adherent red scale that then started to bleed. 
So if you have a patient who tells you that this is a bleeding area, this requires a biopsy to rule out squamous cell carcinoma. So please do that. And same with this patient. He had a red scaly area there, just didn't quite go away. You can tell it's bled because he's got a crust sitting there. So if you see that crust, that means it's bled. That means this should be biopsied to rule out squamous cell carcinoma. And this, a very unusual uh, lesion in the suprapubic area, uh, supra suprapubic area. I wasn't quite sure what the heck this was. Brown, I thought, could this be an abnormal melanoma? Came up quite quickly. This also is squamous cell carcinoma in situ, or Bowen's disease. We tend to see that around the genital area. And again, if you see unusual looking lesions, be they red and started to bleed, or brown, don't forget that we're starting to see a lot of this in our HIV-infected patients, particularly the uh, crowd that's been well-controlled for 20 years. And again, just a close-up image. And this patient is one of my favorite old-time patients who had multiple squamous cell carcinomas. You can see an area here and back here. And this, to me, uh, represented a very sad situation in that he died before the age of antiretrovirals um, from metastatic squamous cell carcinoma with a CD4 count of 500. So don't forget that squames kill people, uh, and we do actually take it very seriously, particularly in our aging HIV-infected group. And again, another squamous cell carcinoma, just want, want you to see what that looks like. They almost always have that central crustiness to it uh, right here. This one, very big with expanded vessels. Uh, this gentleman did quite well. This is actually a picture through teledermatology, which, by the way, I just want to say that we're using a lot of teledermatology now to increase access uh, where there are no dermatologists. So if you can hook up, uh, if you can't hook up, always feel free to send pictures. I'm very happy to always look at pictures from anyone, anywhere. So uh, please do. Uh, squamous cell carcinomas in the HIV group. Well, there's definitely a higher incidence of squamous cells and basal cells in at least two HIV cohorts that have been studied. A very interesting fact that we have just learned at UCSF is that recurrent squamous cell carcinomas seem to be happening at a very higher rate than in the non-immunosuppressed host. So uh, we have a woman, Meg Crenn, who is looking at a large cohort of uh, non-HIV infected patients, just anyone who's had a squamous cell at UCSF. And what she noted was, in fact, that in the HIV crowd within that cohort, 17% had recurrent squames compared to only 3% in the non-HIV infected group. They also appeared in half the time and in younger than expected age group. And this is very worrisome to those of us who are doing dermatology in that we're seeing these squamous cell carcinomas, particularly recurrent ones, happening in this, in this group. Why? Does this signify what we're thinking about in terms of premature aging? And I, I bring to your attention this gentleman, HIV infected. This is a recurrent squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, here's another recurrent squamous cell carcinoma. They just tend to pop up. Uh, this guy's CD4 count up and down, not, not the most adherent of patients, uh, but died of his squamous cell carcinoma a couple of months back. And this gentleman, too, uh, HIV infected, he looks like he's older. Uh, he looks like he's in his 80s. He's not. He's about 60. And again, recurrent squamous cell carcinoma. Again, he died uh, a few months ago as well. So these are, are really worrisome uh, things that we're starting to see right now in our group. So pay attention to those actinic keratoses. Please biopsy when you need to, to rule out squamous cell, and have a real low threshold for following these patients over and over again. See them frequently to make sure that you're catching things at the earliest stage when you can actually do some surgical excision because I want to tell you that we have very limited chemotherapeutic uh, ways to take care of these patients. Our mainstay of treatment is excision. 
I want to briefly talk about prednisone use because what I've tended to see now in my aging HIV population is a lot of use of prednisone. We used to be worried about giving prednisone to our HIV-infected patients, but now that we have sort of restored their CD4 counts, there's not so much worry. And patients are coming in, getting a little older, they have back problems, they have knee joint problems, they are having uh, pulmonary problems that, for which they're getting inhalers and injections and prednisone. Uh, now, you also know that many of our HIV-infected patients have this virus, HHV8, which causes Kaposi's sarcoma. Many of them are asymptomatic with this HHV8. But then they see prednisone in, or systemic steroids in one way or another, and now we're seeing a whole bunch of people developing Kaposi's sarcoma. It looks like this prednisone is turning on the HHV8 virus and causing Kaposi's sarcoma to become symptomatic. And so this is not an atypical situation in our group at uh, UCSF. And here again, not, uh, not big lesions, not horrible lesions, but here's a Kaposi's sarcoma lesion. And uh, I don't know, I, I'd love to hear from the audience. Are you seeing Kaposi's sarcoma? Uh, hands, show of hands. So not so much over here. I can tell you that on the West Coast, uh, we are seeing Kaposi's sarcoma. This last week, we have just made four new diagnoses of Kaposi's sarcoma in our very small clinic. So we're seeing a lot of it. It's coming. It's more. I'm not exactly sure why, but I am worried about the prednisone use. What is the treatment for Kaposi's sarcoma? Well, we continue patients on ARVs uh, if there's no organ involvement or if, li if there's limited cutaneous disease. IV chemo is what we use for more advanced disease, and we're really looking at doxyl or the liposomal anthracyclines. And I just want to alert you to the fact that we do have multiple clinical trials going on uh, with the AIDS Malignancy Consortium. So if your patient has failed treatment with standard antiretrovirals, please do have a look at that website uh, for clinical trials. Kaposi sarcoma, though, does create a lot of what we call lymphedema. It kind of gets into the lymph nodes and obliterates them, causing edema. And even though some of our IV chemotherapy gets rid of uh, the Kaposi sarcoma, patients are left with debilitating edema. And that is a very common situation that we're seeing. This patient's uh, Kaposi sarcoma gone, but the edema is terrible here. And again, here as well, you can see that this patient has what we call retention hyperkeratosis. Yes, these are KS lesions, but also has this very mossy look to his foot. That's as a result of edema. Expansion and decreasing of the edema leaves you with this kind of furry, mossy look called retention hyperkeratosis. But again, this is an indication that the KS has gone into the lymph nodes and has done some permanent damage. So, what do we do for these patients? Well, again, we're not brilliant. And I can tell you that this persistent lymphedema is leaving patients with large erosions and ulcers, leading to secondary infection. And uh, here's a guy with KS gone. He's been on uh, IV doxyl for a while. His KS is no longer active, but bad edema. And then again, you can see the breakdown of the skin. This is open to every infection. And we just had two patients uh, who were in the ICU with group G strep. It seems that group G strep loves these kinds of legs. Uh, one guy requiring all kinds of interventions and uh, uh, four pressors to keep him alive while he went through his septic episode. So this is a real problem and a persistent problem of Kaposi's sarcoma. So what do we do? Well, lymphatic massage, maybe compression. That's where we're going with this. We're putting on UNA boots using, you know, mega compression stockings. Um, we have friends in the fields of filariasis and podoconiosis. These are tropical diseases, but they also infiltrate the lymph system, creating a lot of edema. And we're trying to borrow some data from them. Uh, seeing what they do. They certainly do use compression, but they also are doing excellent foot care. 
And that, along with the compression, seems to decrease the uh, lymphedema by two centimeters, which is pretty remarkable. And again, this is a patient with lymphedema caused by filariasis. But again, compression is key. And again, just a closer up, you can see that mossy look again that I talked about, that retention hyperkeratosis. Um, but here's the deal. You want to make sure that your patients practice good foot care uh, and get in there, make sure that there's no maceration between the toes uh, leading to uh, breakdown of skin. And that, with the compression, seems to eventuate and decrease lymphedema. So just a word on tinea pedis, because this is a big problem in this set of patients. Uh, for that maceration between the toes, buy some dry sol. Have your patients buy aluminum chloride dry sol. It's called put it between their toes, then go ahead and have them use econazole or whatever antifungal you like between those toes. But unless you dry the area first, it just becomes a whole mess in there, leading to more maceration. Uh, we can also treat the onychomycosis with oral antifungals, and that's the dose Lamisil 250Q day for four weeks, um, for four months. Just wanted to show you this patient who, after our last talk, you might think has anal cancer. You wouldn't be wrong in thinking about this. Uh, I thought that this was anal cancer, but lo and behold, this is herpes simplex. Uh, and this is what we call herpes vegetans. So a very thickened area uh, of skin in the herpes area. And most of these patients who have this verrucous herpes vegetans, uh, they are actually resistant to acyclovir. Uh, and whether or not, again, in this aging group of patients who have been on acyclovir for years, we may be selecting out these mutations and actually creating some of these resistant to acyclovir uh, herpes lesions. How do we treat with sedovavir or foscarna? We're even injecting these areas now uh, with that. And I want to just briefly touch on the CD4 depleted patient. As I said, these tend to be our younger patients now. We're seeing a whole new cohort coming in with very low CD4 counts. Some of these patients have had little access to health care. Some of these patients are, are drug users uh, who just haven't been interested or linked to care or are non-adherent. And they're coming in with the stuff that we saw 20, 25 years ago, the bad seborrheic dermatitis, the zoster, the Kaposi sarcoma, tinea, opportunistic infections of the skin, sometimes all in the same patient. And I want to show you this particular uh, patient who comes in with what we call SIBO psoriasis. This is bad seborrheic dermatitis that we used to see years ago. Uh, very low CD4 count, and you can see that she's got a lot of scale, and it even extends onto the back and definitely onto the scalp, is even impetigenized. How do you deal with this? Well, certainly having your patients on antiretrovirals makes this particular uh, uh, problem much easier to treat. Our treatment is really with antifungals, topical antifungals and topical steroids, usually combined. And don't forget to treat the impetigenized areas here uh, with antibiotics. But this is long-term treatment. And again, this does respond to antiretroviral therapy, but takes months and months. So bad sebderm. What about zoster? Well, zoster is always interesting to me because the first episode occurs around a CD4 count of about 315, so not real low. In HIV, it can be a little bit different than what you're used to in herpes zoster in that the lesions are often monomorphic. You will all remember from chickenpox and, and zoster that in the non-immunosuppressed host that you're supposed to see stages of lumps and bumps, that some are crusted, not so in HIV zoster. HIV zoster can certainly disseminate either from a zosteriform lesion uh, or can present de novo as chickenpox. And of course, HIV-infected patients can have multiple episodes of zoster. And who gets that, those multiple episodes? It seems to be in persons who have less than perfect adherence. So it's not dependent on CD4 count 
or viral load, but rather adherence, which I think is a very interesting piece of information. Here's a patient presents uh, to the surgeons, actually, with a red leg, and they gave him some IV antibiotics, chased him out of the hospital. He came back the following day with these blisters, as you can see. And here you can see the various stages of blistering, uh, or, or I'm sorry, of the vesicles. There's some crusts, there are some newer lesions, so typical uh, of zoster. He's HIV infected, and it disseminated. And again, you can see this widely disseminate, disseminated look of uh, chickenpox or zoster. And here, too, another patient HIV infected. You can see that he's had a previous area of zoster uh, characterized here by this nice scar and now has a secondary uh, episode of zoster. And as I said, really seems to occur when the adherence is not perfect. But zoster can also be part of immune reconstitution. Uh, and so this patient came in, and I had just told my residents, yes, well, you get zoster when people aren't really adherent to their drugs. And so this guy told me he was on antiretrovirals, but he got zoster, and I thought, mm, you're just not taking them. He said, no, really, I, am take, I, I have now become very adherent to my drugs. And yes, indeed, he uh, was on antiretrovirals, and he did have iris. So zoster, immune reconstitution, secondary to beginning antiretrovirals, can definitely occur. And please note here, unlike the last patient I showed you, look at these monomorphic lesions. You cannot see that various staging where you have crusts, et cetera, but these monomorphic lesions, my residents weren't actually even convinced that these were vesicles of zoster, but they, they certainly are. And just a close-up image. Uh, they're on just one half of the body. A treatment of zoster, of course, uh, high-dose antivirals, acyclovir 800 five times a day, or valacyclovir, a gram TID. Interestingly, postherpetic neuralgia is not a major problem in HIV. Don't ask me why, except for the region of V1. And again, so if you do have a patient with V1 involvement, you want you may want to think about IV acyclovir for that patient. Uh, this can be a real problem, a real painful problem. Uh, and you can see our patient here who had this persistent pain, which he dug down deep, uh, just could not get rid of that, that pain from postherpetic neuralgia. But in general, not a big problem in other parts of the body. And this patient, you can barely see it. In fact, I didn't. Thankfully, an astute resident did see this almost purple blush uh, in this uh, patient who had not been linked into care with a pretty low CD4 count. This is Kaposi sarcoma. So again, be on the lookout. Know that it's there. Know that we're seeing three or four cases each week now. Uh, you, and there you go. It's a little out of focus there, but very light purple blush. You biopsy that. That's KS. So first-line therapy, as I said, still antiretrovirals. And please, if your patient does get KS iris, unlike other iris, please don't use prednisone. You will kill your patient. So again, we have seen patients who have KS. They're started on antiretrovirals, and they get blossoming, blooming Kaposi sarcoma. And the practitioner says, ah, I know what to do with this. I'll give them prednisone. And then these patients develop visceral involvement, and uh, we have unfortunately hurt a few of those patients. And again, Kaposi sarcoma, this time at the bottom of the foot. So you need to know where to look. Don't forget the mouth, behind the ears, in the ears, on the genital areas, look on the feet. These are areas that we often don't examine. But for early detection, it's very important. This patient came in. Uh, a few weeks back, and again, pretty low CD4 count uh, with these purple lesions that could have easily been Kaposi sarcoma, but this is bacillary angiomatosis. Uh, very good presentation of that with this kind of collarette of scale, and you can see that beautiful, almost explosive look of bacillary angiomatosis coming through the skin with this nice collarette of scale. And tinea. I can't say enough for tinea uh, in our HIV-infected population with low CD4 counts. We see 
very weird looking tinea. Uh, serpiginous borders around the face, the neck. Take, oh, I'm sorry. Well, here's the treatment for bacillary angiomatosis, I did want to say. Bartonella is the agent in bacillary angiomatosis for which we treat with at least six weeks of doxycycline or erythromycin. Don't forget to get blood cultures on these individuals. Uh, often we see this with accompanying fever. Anyway, back to tinea. Here you can see this nice rim right here and this red neck. If you scratch that, you'll see the scale of tinea. But that is wonderful tinea in someone whose CD4 count is quite low. And again, please note this very funny serpiginous rim, uh, again, an indication of tinea. And you don't see this in persons who have pretty good CD4 counts. This is usually an indication of a low CD4 count. And again, likewise here, you can see these acral area, this acral area with these annular-like lesions, kind of strange. Again, low CD4 count, tinea, and a very immunosuppressed host. And I will leave you with this picture uh, of anal cancer, I think apropos to our last speaker. Uh, but again, uh, this is not going anywhere except this area right here. But my, my point here is don't forget to look uh, because so often we don't look at the skin, which can give us many good points. Uh, and something you can do for this, this was taken care of with wide local excision, and this patient did not actually have anal dysplasia, uh, which was uh, an interesting fact to me. But with that, I will end, and uh, happy to take any questions or stick around, uh, whatever is your preference. Thank you so much. Questions? Yes. I'm sorry, zoster vaccine is the, are we using zoster vaccine? I am not using zoster vaccine at the moment. We really, uh, there, there is some data that's coming out shortly as to whether it's safe, not safe, et cetera. Uh, so I haven't sort of been given the green light yet with regard to zoster vaccine. Are you using it at all? No, okay. Anyone in the audience using zoster vaccine in there? With high CD4 counts, people are using, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Yes, thank you so much. The question is, given some of the subtleties, let's say in Kaposi's sarcoma, for example, is it hard to have early detection, uh, particularly in persons of color? Uh, and it is absolutely uh, true that it's very hard to see some of this. Uh, when, when you have what we call type 5, type 6 skin. Uh, and uh, again, I'm doing a lot of work in Africa where, in fact, patients come in with Kaposi sarcoma lesions that are so advanced, it's, it's unbelievable. And we're talking about very young people. Kaposi sarcoma is the number one killer of HIV-infected patients in Africa. Uh, and part of that is because people are presenting with very advanced lesions because early detection is difficult. Uh, and so we have started mass campaigns, uh, really dealing with traditional healers uh, and nurses and clinical officers, really trying to educate people as to what to look for. Uh, and again, many of these areas can mimic other diseases. So post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation can look like Kaposi's sarcoma and vice versa. So we're also really advocating biopsy. And that's a question that I'm often asked is, really, do we need to biopsy this? And the answer is yes, please biopsy this. If you think that there's something that's not looking right or it looks like it's just a small shade of something, you might be able to do that biopsy, pick up Kaposi sarcoma at its earliest, and really start treatment when antiretrovirals actually have a chance of working. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Yes? One thing we're seeing in our clinics now today is I know what this is. <laughs> right. Well, thank you. The question is scabies. How can we think about it? How can we detect it? How can we differentiate it? And that's the first thing I will say is not everything that itches is scabies. So I end up seeing 
everything that itch is having been treated as scabies incorrectly. Uh, so that, that's a big difference. Uh, we like to use the gold standard of scraping, but I will tell you that I was in family practice before I was a dermatologist, and like that never happened. I never scraped anything because we don't have time to do that, and where's the microscope, and where are the slides, forget it. Um, one of the things that you can definitely do is look for the high-risk areas, and of course you want to look between the fingers, the web spaces of the toes. But another key area to look for these little bumps, and they're almost like vesicles, is the lateral edge of the foot right here, the lateral edge of the foot, a great place to look for scabies. If someone has itchy areas. And then the key place to look, almost pathognomonic, is you look at the genital region. Uh, itchy bumps on the genital region equals scabies until proven otherwise. So, you know, if, if you've got that in a patient, go ahead and treat. I mean, I, that's the only time I won't make my residents do a scraping. But uh, otherwise, um, definitely treat there and look for those places. One other place to look, the scapula, the edge of the scapula, and you're looking again for itchy bumps. Forget burrows. Oh my gosh, you know, great if you see it, but most of us don't even really know what a burrow looks like, in truth. Um, but uh, if you see it, great, but don't hang your hat on that because, you know, you, you will have missed a lot of scabies if you're looking for burrows. Yeah? How's the best way to scrape for uh, scabies, how to do a scabies prep, should you actually have all the equipment. So first of all, mineral oil, forget it. You don't need mineral oil. We don't have mineral oil at my county hospital. We're just too cheap to buy it or to store it or something. Uh, so I use water. Use water, that's just fine. Um, what you want to do is you want to get a fresh, what I call a virginal lesion, one that has not been excoriated by the patient. Uh, and you want to take a 15 blade and just scrape down. You want to get right down, often people say right down to blood. Uh, you want to get some of the juice that's in that thing and some of the scale uh, and just slap that onto a slide, put a slide cover on that and a little drop of water. And you should be able, on pretty low power, by the way, to see either the mite itself, the feces, which comes out as little black dots, uh, or the eggs, which are just little oval-shaped uh, areas. Uh, but, but that's the key, is really you don't need anything fancy, and you want to go for those lesions that almost pop. And you can almost tell, because they are lesions that pop uh, if you really have scabies. So again, and you want to look, you want to do the scabies prep on those high-risk areas, between the fingers, the lateral edge of the toes, the genitalia, if somebody will let you. Uh, and, uh, and there you have it. That, that'll, that's a good scabies prep. And look through the entire slide. Uh, the little mite likes to try to escape from the slide cover. So make sure you're looking at the edges of the slide cover, because that's where you will often find your scabies mite as they're trying to crawl away. So, OK? Great. Thank you so much. <laughs>